Hello, I'm Dr. Helen Scales, author and marine biologist, and I'm so pleased to be here th today to talk to you, even though, as you can tell, none of you are actually in the room, as would normally be the case. But it's lovely to be speaking to you all at home, so thanks so much for joining me. And if uh, any of you have any questions at all um, for me, I will be hanging around at the end, so we'll have a bit of a Q&A session. So keep those questions in mind, and we can answer those later on, as I tell you more about the wonders of the deep. If we look at our planet Earth from space, it's pretty obvious that we live on a water planet. Seven tenths of the surface are covered in a vast interconnected ocean. And that ocean has shaped human lives for thousands of years. But it's always been the surface and the very edges of the ocean that have mattered the most. We've sailed across the surface to find fish and to reach distant shores, and we've settled that boundary between land and water. But the stuff that lies beneath the waves, far down there, has pretty much always remained out of sight and out of mind. But that is now changing, and humanity's close ties to the ocean are sinking deeper. It wasn't really so long ago that it was generally assumed that the deep sea was a great big empty space with nothing living there at all. Maybe 200 years ago, it was generally assumed that the deep sea was too dark, there was far too much pressure, it was too cold, there was no food, so how could anything survive there at all? Whereas, of course, now we know that the deep ocean is full of extraordinary life forms. All sorts of wonderful things live down there. And we're really living through a golden era of, of scientific discovery in the deep. We have a fantastic technologies that are opening up a bigger view, a more intricate view of what lives in the deep. And at the same time, as scientists are looking harder and longer into the deep, we're seeing more and more just how important this part of our planet is. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Why the deep matters to all of us. Even though most of us are never going to get to go there, we're not going to get to see it firsthand, but there are all sorts of reasons and there's all sorts of connections that link us to this extraordinary, deep, vast realm on our planet. That means it really does matter to all of us. And in particular, I want to tell you about some really exciting scientific discoveries that are going on that are finding new ideas and new innovations and inspirations in the deep sea, which could soon really start helping our lives out here on land, saving lives, solving problems that we have. And that's inspiration is coming from this wonderful realm where so much fantastic stuff lives. But first of all, let's go on a dive into the deep ocean. I want to try and get you to wrap your heads around, first of all, just how big the deep sea is, because that's a really important aspect to this enormous place, is just how very big it is. And uh, to help me with this, um, I asked a physicist friend of mine who's very good at maths to help me do some calculations to, to really try and grasp just how big the deep sea is. And so I said, I asked him, OK, if I took a normal glass marble and if I sailed offshore and I dropped it over the side of my sailing ship, how long would it take to reach the bottom? Well, not just that. How long would it also take to reach different zones in the sea? The deep sea isn't just one big open space. It's divided up into different zones where different things live, different conditions that influence life that's there. So how long is it going to take to reach all these different zones? And I thought that would help me get an idea of just how big the sea is. So he did his calculations. He worked out how far, fast my little marble was going to drop. And he told me, well, for the first seven minutes, that marble is going to drop through the surface of the sea, the sunlit zone, the euphotic zone, the part where the sun still shines. This is the familiar ocean, where all those fish that we know so well, those whales and dolphins, everything else, is swimming around, happily consuming the products of photosynthesis. There's lots of sunlight still here, and there are plants, there's algae and plankton and seaweed that are harnessing that energy uh, from the sun to convert carbon dioxide into sugars and everything else essentially feeds off of that. So it's a wonderful world full of food and full of species, the ones we know the best. But after seven minutes, my marble is gonna leave the sunlit zone and enter the deep sea for real. The beginning, the official beginning of the deep sea is 200 meters, where the sunlight begins to run out and it enters, my marble will fall into what we call the twilight zone. There is still some light, but it's very dim blue light, the kind of thing you'd see if you walked outside uh, just after sunset, and you've got that lovely deep blue sky and a very dim light. 
It's like that all the time during the day in the twilight zone, below 200 metres. And there's stuff living there, wonderful creatures living there, like this Dumbo octopus. This is where sperm whales go hunting for enormous squid. This is where huge shoals of little fish called lanternfish shoal around and swim in enormous abundance. There are trillions of these things. Probably the most abundant vertebrates on the planet occupy the twilight zone. It's full of wonderful life. And my marble is going to fall through the twilight zone for around half an hour. It reaches from 200 meters down to about 1,000 meters. So after that, it carries on down into the place where there's no sunlight at all the midnight zone. This is the next zone of the sea as we're going downwards. And it's got its own wonderful creatures that live there. There's no sunlight, but there is light. There's plenty of light, actually, because one thing that the inhabitants of the midnight zone do incredibly well is make their own light. Bioluminescence, the ability to make light, is incredibly common amongst deep sea species all the way through the water column, but especially in the midnight zone, where it's permanently dark. Being able to make your own light is incredibly useful for an organism that lives in this strange place. Here are some of my favorites. These are swimming worms of various types. They pirouette and spin through the water and they can go forwards and backwards. They're incredibly agile. Um, these two, uh, with the, the one with the red stripe and the one with the uh, orange stripe are called gossamer worms or tomopterus. And these are bioluminescent. They have a really cool trick. If they get disturbed by a predator, what they do is they emit a golden, cloud of uh, particles which distract that predator, hopefully. That's the idea, that uh, getting a, a face full of colour and bright light in the dark deep is going to be a bit distracting, gives that worm time to swim off and hopefully save itself. Um, there's another glowing worm here. At the bottom right-hand corner is a green bomber worm. I think you can probably guess what they get up to. Hopefully you can uh, just about make out they've got these green orbs attached to their bodies. And when they get disturbed, they throw these bombs into the water and they explode into light and again have this effect of uh, distracting a predator or an intruder while that worm swims off into the dark deep, hopefully to save itself. Now, these really are true glowworms. Things we call glowworms out here on land, they're actually beetles. They're not worms at all, but these are genuine glowworms and the, ocean, the deep ocean is full of them. And there's all sorts of glowing creatures in the deep. Fish, octopuses, squid, loads of things make their own light. Uh, around about three quarters of them, actually, of the species in the deep sea are bioluminescent. So it's, it's almost compulsory to have light if you live in this place. And you can see why it's so useful. You can distract predators. There are lots of animals that wink and blink at each other with their lights to find mates and to communicate. You can even use lights to see through the dark like a flashlight. It's a very useful thing to do, and it's evolved many, many times amongst all the deep sea creatures. So they're brilliantly adapted to live in this permanent dark of the midnight zone. My marble is going to fall through the midnight zone for another hour and a half. It reaches from 1,000 metres down to 4,000 metres. It's a great big swathe of the deep sea. But it's going to keep on falling down into the next zone, which is the abyssal zone. Now, we use the word abyss quite generally. It's been around for a long time. It's meant all sorts of things, and it's generally used for bits of the deep sea. But scientists think of it as really being this zone below 4,000 metres. And... One of the things that's happening when we get this deep into the ocean is, well, the pressure. It really is extraordinarily high pressure down this far underwater, four kilometers down under the sea. And this is actually the average depth of the ocean. So actually, in a lot of parts, it only goes this far, 4K. Still a really, really long way. And the thing that we find, increasingly we find living in the deep sea, is a bit of a contradiction. We find beautiful, delicate creatures in this harsh, high-pressure world. We see these jelly creatures, like, well, various things that we would call jellyfish. They look like jellyfish. Um, they're actually a whole bunch of different organisms from different parts of the animal tree, but they've all evolved this body made essentially of jelly, a, je a, a thin, watery uh, solution of, of the protein collagen. Basically, that's what jelly is. And they, are, they look incredibly delicate, but they survive in this incredibly harsh world. And in fact, having a body made of jelly is a great adaptation for this extreme part of the deep sea. It doesn't get too affected by pressure. They haven't got any air bubbles that would get squeezed. It's virtually, virtually impossible to have any air down there. They just simply couldn't pump it out of their bodies to fill a bladder or a lung or anything like that. So jelly is a really, really good thing to make your body from if you live in, in the abyss. Also because it's very cheap. It's not very expensive in terms of food and energy to run a jelly body compared to a muscly body. 
Um, so they just drift around. They're not very strong, but they, they can live and survive a very efficient life down in the abyss. And they need that because the abyss is a really hungry place. There is no new food being made anywhere in this dark part of the ocean. There's no photosynthesis in these open waters. It's no, there's no sunlight. So the food that they rely on all comes from the surface. And it's stuff that we call, it trickles, trickles down from above, these little particles that we call marine snow. You can see them in this picture, those dots in the background. Um, and it sounds lovely, doesn't it? Marine snow, how nice that this is. This is stuff that trickles down from the surface that feeds the deep. Well, it's not that nice. Actually, it's mostly bits of dead plankton from the surface falling down, as well as their feces, various other bits of organic stuff that clumps together in flakes and falls down into the deep. But it's really important, and it's the food that most of the deep sea relies on. And it's a very thin trickle of food. It's only about 2% of the food that's made in the surface seas will actually make it down in marine snow, down into the abyss. So organisms have evolved ways of catching that snow and eating it. Um, so jellyfish will catch it, will, will spread themselves out and catch that snow from the water. There are, there's a thing called a vampire squid, which sounds really terrifying, but actually it lives a very gentle life, simply gathering snow, building, packing snowballs together in its tentacles and eating them, and that's how it survives. But there's just not much food, so being efficient, having a jelly body, not using too much energy, is one of the survival strategies for this extreme part of the deep sea. This isn't the bottom of the deep sea, though. It goes further on. My marble's going to keep dropping down through the abyss into the very deepest zone we have, which is the Hadal zone. Now, this is in parts of the ocean where there are trenches, great big deep V-shaped chasms that form mostly at the edges of tectonic plates where one shoves underneath another and it dives down into the oceanic crust and forms these chasms. You might know that the Mariana Trench is the deepest one we have, the deepest, deepest part of the ocean, around 11 kilometers. There's lots more, there's about 40 in total. Several of them are around 10 kilometers or more. So we have these very deep chasms going ever further down and there's things living in them. This is a video shot just earlier this year in the Mariana Trench. This is 7,037 meters. And this guy is a snailfish. And these are the vertebrates that live in trenches, the deepest dwelling vertebrates, doing a little swim by there. A pudgy pink fish is not what you might think of as a stereotypical deep sea fish. You generally think big teeth, you need to eat things. If you're not eating marine snow, you've got to try and eat something else like a worm for it swimming around. But these guys really are the quintessential deep sea uh, trench species that are, are incredibly pressure proof. They have all these adaptations to, to be able to survive under such incredible pressure so far down. And they're eating these white things that are swimming around. Um, these are amphipods, types of crustaceans, relatives of crabs uh, and shrimp. Um, and they're scavengers. They'll eat pretty much anything that lands down in a trench. Trenches are quite good. They funnel stuff down, lots of marine snow, bits of debris come down. In this video, they're actually feeding on a bait, uh, a bait of fish, I think, has been put down. This is a baited camera. It's one way we study down in these deep trenches is by basically lowering down a camera with a bunch of food fixed to it so that things like the amphipods will come in and feed on that, and then the snailfish come and eat the amphipods. That's what they eat. So it's quite a simple food chain down there, but we do have organisms living all the way down at the bottom of the ocean. And my marble, if, it, if I was good with my aim and I managed to get it down to the bottom of one of these trenches, to the deepest one, it would take six hours from the surface all the way to the bottom. That's how far down the bottom of the sea is. It's extraordinary. And as we've shown, all the way down, as my marble has form, fallen, lights have glinted off it from all those bioluminescent animals. Possibly some of them have tried to eat it. But all the way down to the bottom of the sea, it's past life. Creatures that have adapted to all of these different challenging conditions of the deep, the pressure, the, no, the, the fact there's no light and very little food, but life has found a way. And this really is an extraordinarily enormous part, the biggest part of the living planet that we live on. 95% we think of the biosphere, the space available for things to live is the deep sea. And we're still finding out so much about it. What lives there, how they survive, how these ecosystems are functioning and, and how everything is getting along in this extreme, extreme conditions. And it's here that scientists are doing some really exciting studies. As well as just discovering what's there, we're looking at what might, we might be able to use and find benefits for humanity, for these distant, distant species. Because it's here that scientists are looking for things like new medicines. 
Now, people have a very long history of using nature as a source of medicines. A lot of the modern drugs we have are made from plants and microbes and things like that. And the deep holds a tremendous potential for a new generation of medicines. And that's for a couple of reasons. Firstly, as we've seen, it's really big and we still have enormous amounts of it to explore. So who knows what we're going to find next? But actually the deep is also just a place where new novel molecules and creatures that make them are, are living. Things are very, very different in the deep because of these adaptations that I've been mentioning to all of these extreme conditions. They mean, it means that these animals are making their bodies in completely different ways to what we see out on land. The way they make their cells, the way they put their molecules together even is different, unlike anything we see. And that holds an enormous potential for new ideas, for the medicines that we desperately need to solve some of the big problems out here on land. And uh, we know already from the initial studies and the things that are ongoing now that the deep really does hold an extraordinarily big treasure chest of these possible molecules, these bioactive uh, molecules. We're looking for uh, compounds that have specific effect on things like cancer cells, on pathogens, bacteria and viruses that we want to kill. And a lot of these molecules that are within these amazing extreme animals are showing themselves to be really, really potent against some of these things we want to combat in the human world. And uh, one group of animals in the deep that are proving to be especially productive are the corals. Now, you might think of corals as animals that live up in the sunlit zone. They actually do. I mean, a lot of those corals uh, use sunlight and they have algae in their tissues to help them survive. But corals also live in the deep sea. We, have, we know of over 5,000 species of coral so far, and more than half of those live down in the deep, including really beautiful things. I mean, colorful things that live in the dark. These yellow bamboo corals and this beautiful spiraling Iridogorgia coral here. And they do, they grow and they flourish in the deep dark sea. They live in particular places. A lot of them will live on the edges of continental shelves. We have these great big shallow seas, at the extension of, of the land, which then tumbles down into the deep sea on these great big uh, sharp, uh, steep escarpments. And there are canyons there, rocky canyons, and we find a lot of corals growing in places like that. Uh, corals also grow on seamounts. We have thousands of enormous underwater volcanoes, some of them dormant, some of them active, down in the deep sea. Um, we can spot the really big ones on satellites. Um, we think there's at least 100,000 really big seamounts, ones that are more than 1,500 meters tall. And they don't stick up from the surface. They're still way, way below. Um, but their influence can be measured from the effect that they have on the surface of the sea. Satellites can measure where there are just slight bulges in the sea surface above these enormous seamounts. Because they're so big, they actually pull water towards them, a bit like the moon is causing the tides on our planet by pulling water towards it because of its huge mass. Um, and these enormous seamounts are making themselves known like that. The, the water crushes in and it bulges up just a little bit, and so that way we can count them. So we know there's at least 100,000 huge seamounts in the deep, and there's loads of smaller ones too. I mean, I mean smaller, at least a thousand meters or less, it's still pretty big, but they don't show up on satellites. So the only way to find those ones is through sonar at the moment. So using beams of sound to map the, bed, the seabed and the shape of the seabed to produce maps like this one. And that requires um, devices dragged along by ships or by underwater robots um, seeing through the dark with, with sound. And we don't have maps of the entire deep sea to show us exactly where all these seamounts are, but there are estimates and we think there could well be tens of millions of enormous, at least 1,000 meters or less, great big seamounts down in the deep. And these are all places where corals grow. Um, lots of seamounts have these amazing, almost old growth forests of corals. Many of these corals live um, for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Bamboo corals are some of the oldest living organisms on the planet. They can live for several thousand years. And they live on these extraordinary features. Alongside other things, sponges. Corals and sponges often grow together in the deep. These sponges are very ancient, very simple creatures. Yes, they look a bit like bath sponges that you have. Um, they're full of holes, but they are animals. They spend their time su um, sucking, filtering water, pulling out little bits of food, bits of, bits of marine snow to eat. And they come in all sorts of weird shapes in the deep sea. Um, this picture here, you can see, it's sort of what you would get on the side of a seamount with, uh, with sponges and with corals in the background, forming this, as I say, a sort of a forest, an old growth forest. These things can grow for a long time. Sponges can also live for hundreds of years. And they're proving to be incredibly potent, full of really potent chemicals that are potentially really useful as new medicines. This is where people are looking 
and sampling um, organisms in the deep sea for these new medicines, particularly corals and sponges. And we think the reason for this partly is because these animals can't move. Same reason that plants on land tend to be full of really complex and powerful chemicals. We find plants full of things like tobacco and nicotine and caffeine and all those medicines that we use. And they have that because they can't run away. These are chemical defenses for these plants. They can't run away from something that wants to eat them, so they defend themselves with nasty tasting chemicals or with toxic chemicals, and it really works. We think the same thing is happening with corals and sponges. They produce these, these chemicals to essentially survive, and especially in the deep, where anything's gonna try and eat you because there's so much, so, so much competition for food that you really need to make sure that you're not very tasty, and that's what these things are doing. They're also full of microbes. Um, sponges suck in a lot of microbes when they're filtering the water, bacteria and things. So they actually have this biome. We have a biome in our guts of bacteria that help us uh, to do all sorts of things and digestion and so on. And so, so do sponges. They have um, as communities of bi microbes living inside them. And those two are potentially really useful in the search for new medicines. Now, so far, there actually aren't that many medicines on the market that have got through to being available as drugs that come from the ocean. There's only six at the moment, and only one that comes from a deep-ish part of the ocean, not even that deep. This is, this is it. This is halochondria, a sponge that comes, I think mostly it's been collected from the deepest is about 100 meters, so it's not really even the deep sea. Um, but this one was discovered in the 1980s, and it's, it shows really how things have changed. Um, it took 25 years for this to go from the discovery of a potentially useful molecule through to the medicine, which was released to the market in 2010 as this um, compound called aribulin, which is used in late-stage metastatic breast cancer. You can see it's a really complex molecule, which is a hint at this idea that things are different in the deep, and we're finding weird chemistry amongst these deep-sea creatures, even though this one's not that deep. It gets weirder as we go down. Um, but what happened, the thing with this one, with halochondria, was that to, to get enough of that sponge to do the studies, once they realized there was something interesting, scientists went back and we had to trawl. They trawled tons and tons of this sponge from the, from the sea to be able to extract enough of that compound to test it and to figure out whether it was going to be useful. And then it's been synthesized and it's now produced in a lab. It isn't just coming from the sea. But it needed that amount in order to really get it to that stage of becoming a useful drug. But um, luckily, that has changed, and we now have fantastic technologies that allow a much more uh, targeted and a much less Im uh, allow us to, to study and, uh, and to collect things from the deep in a much more targeted way that doesn't have any impact just as much as trawling up tons of sponge used to have. Um, and this is, this is one of these machines that which, uh, a lot of scientists now use for studying the deep. It's a remote-operated submersible, sometimes called a remote-operated vehicle, an ROV. And basically, it's a robot that dives down deep under, under the water, and it's controlled from the surface along a long cable that's, that weaves uh, several miles to the surface. Some of these are rated down to 6,000 meters. They can go into trenches and deeper, um, and mostly a bit, bit shallower than that, but uh, this one I know went to at least 2,000. And uh, it's controlled from the surface. It's got fantastic high-definition cameras, and a pilot basically sits on deck um, and controls the movements of, uh, of that robot. You can see what it's seeing through these cameras that are broadcasting live feed, um, and it can take things back with it, which is, which is a pretty cool thing for this sort of research for new medicines. Um, they have these manipulator arms, and the pilots can control that. They can open and close and move them around and snip things and take individual colonies of coral. They can stand and look on the side of a seamount and see the scientists can all be watching the feed coming up onto the ship, and say, oh, look, that looks interesting. That coral there, we don't think we've got that one yet. Let's take a sample of that. And the ROV can go in and just take one piece of that coral, carefully snipping it, like pruning uh, flowers in a garden. They, they aren't causing that much impact on the ecosystem. They just need small samples, because that's all we need now. We've got fantastic laboratory techniques now to amplify these chemicals, to characterize what's there. We can grow microbes and proliferate those we can sequence their DNA and figure out what genes they have for these, these sorts of chemicals as well. We don't actually even need the chemical itself, just the gene that produces it, and we can work out what they're doing. So this is how we're opening up the deep and finding so many more potentially really potent, useful chemicals living amongst things uh, like the corals and sponges. And there really are hundreds of these things. I'm just going to give you a couple of examples, mainly partly just to show you what kind of weird molecules we're finding in the deep. 
Here's a blurry picture of a deep sea sponge, Laodomatium, down at uh, over 2,400 meters. And that was found to contain this thing which was named. It was a brand new molecule. No one had ever seen anything shaped like this before. Uh, they called it Laodomatolide. Weird, weird thing. Um, and it's been found to be really potent against all sorts of types of cancerous tumors, leukemia, um, lung cancer, all sorts of things. So potentially one that we could be seeing rolled out as a medicine in the future. Here's another one. I mean, look at these. It's ridiculous. Koshikamides, these massive great big molecules, again found in the sponge, Theonella. And these ones are effective against HIV. Fantastic. Who knows what will happen with those? Um, here's one more. This actually isn't a coral. It looks like one, I admit. It's because you're all becoming experts by now, I'm sure, with my pictures. This is um, a different type of deep sea creature. It's a crinoid, which is a relative of starfish and sea cucumbers, things like that. Um, but it looks like a coral and it behaves like one. It's pretty much stuck in place. So it faces this same problem of trying not to be eaten. And again, it's producing lots of chemicals. These ones are um, gymnochromes. And uh, again, weird complex molecules. Uh, and these ones have been found to be effective against uh, ovarian cancer cells. And also the superbug, MRSA. This is something else we're looking for in the deep in particular, is new antibiotics. I'm sure you're aware of this problem we have of the rising resistance of the antibiotics we have against uh, strains of bacteria that are re evolving resistance to what, to, to what we have, um, the antibiotics that we currently have. And looking for new types of antibiotic in the deep is again something that's going to be hopefully really useful and really potent because we're looking for different types of molecules, different ways of killing bacteria. Because the real problem is and one of the reasons, really the reason why we have this problem of resistance, well, partly it's because we're overusing antibiotics in human medicine and in agriculture, and we're accelerating a natural process of resistance. Bacteria do naturally become resistant to antibiotics because the antibiotics themselves are mostly chemicals that the bacteria themselves make. That's what we're borrowing from them, ideas of how they kill each other. And they, they naturally will evolve resistance. Over billions of years, that's what they do. But we're really massively accelerating that because we're throwing so much of their own medicine back at those bacteria. The problem also is that we only, we haven't had a new, really new type of antibiotic in 30 years. Everything that's come out in the last 30 years have basically been different versions of the same things. And we need, we need radically different types of antibiotic to really break this cycle of resistance. So we have groups of classes of antibiotics. So beta-lactams, for example, include penicillin and several other different types of antibiotic, but they all basically work in the same way. They stop um, the cell walls of bacteria from forming properly, and so they burst. They kill the bacteria that way, which works until the bacteria are wise to that, and they evolve ways to resist this type of attack. So any more beta-lactams are probably going to have the same resistance as the ones we already have. What we need are antibiotics that have completely different molecules, a bit like these weird ones I've been showing you, things that work in totally different ways that those bacteria have yet to evolve any resistance to. So we'll see. This is another um, deep sea sponge, a beautiful um, glass sponge made out of this sort of woven textured um, silica. And researchers in Plymouth University have recently found some uh, molecules in bacteria growing in this sky that, again, are, seem to be effective against MRSA, that superbug. We'll see. Time will tell how long and which of these potential molecules will make it through the, the drug discovery pipeline. This is the one end, pushing all these interesting new weird molecules into this pipeline in which it's a, it's a long road to get to, it's a long pipeline to get to the other end where a, a medicine comes out that we can actually use. Testing has to be done. It's got to be figured out if this thing is going to work. What kind of mo molecule is it? Can it be produced in large amounts? What are the side effects? All those things. But we'll see. And I, I do think that it won't be too long until we find new medicines coming out on the market that have been inspired by the oceans and especially by the deep sea, because we're finding so much cool stuff down there. Now, it's not just medicines we're looking for in the deep sea. Scientists are also finding other sources of inspiration for other things that we might be able to do differently out here on land. And one of them comes from this animal, which I think is just the ultimate strange deep sea inhabitant. This is the scaly foot snail. Um, and just look at it. I mean, if, even if you don't really know much about mollusks, you've got to be able to tell that this is weird. This is a very strange animal. Well, I should tell you first, really, that its shell is made of iron. An iron compound, uh, some of it's pyrite, basically fool's gold, these shiny black, um, shiny golden uh, snails. 
And that's very strange. It's unique, in fact. We haven't found any other animal yet anywhere in the world that makes its shell or any hard part of its body out of iron. Everything else, bones, skeletons, they're all oxygen-based. This is the only one that does it with iron. And then look at those feet. Snails covered in scales. This is very, very strange. We don't see this anywhere else at all as well. And they're also made out of this iron-based, iron sulfide compound. Very weird. Now, when these were discovered in 2000, um, I should say they're, they're about golf ball size, these little snails. When they were discovered, scientists quite rightly thought, well, that is clearly an animal that's trying to protect itself. We know that the deep is a difficult place. Um, everything's trying to eat everything else if they're not scoffing marine snow coming down. So presumably this guy is trying to stop itself from being eaten somehow. It is a snail in shining armor. But in fact, last year, scientists discovered that it could well be the exact opposite. And in fact, the true story about these snails could be that they're defending themselves from a threat that comes from within. Now, these animals live on hydrothermal vents, a very strange ecosystem that we know about from the deep. We've only known about them for about 40 years. They were discovered in 1977. And it really did blow apart the minds of biologists around the world. And they continue to do so today. This is a very strange place which revolutionized our thinking about how life can exist and the possibilities of life on Earth and perhaps elsewhere in the universe as well. Now, originally it was geologists who found these things and they really um, weren't looking for any animal life. That was not what they were expecting. They detected these hot plumes belching up from deep, miles down deep beneath the waves and wanted to know what was going on. So some of them went down in a submersible, one of the kinds that people can climb inside. This one is it's Alvin, which is still plying the seas today, doing amazing science. They climbed into that sphere in the middle and went down several miles to this, this uh, place where they had detected this hot water coming out. And, and one of the geologists on board was speaking through the communications to the ship up at the surface. And apparently he said, isn't the deep supposed to be a desert? But there's all these animals here. He looked out of the window and just saw this extraordinary ecosystem, this abundant world of life that no one was expecting to see. Things like these tube worms up in the top left-hand corner. Giant tube worms, they're six feet long, they're taller than I am, um, living in these tubes with red bits sticking out of them. There were giant um, shells, there were giant clams and anemones, all sorts of things living on this vent, this hydrothermal vent which they had discovered. Um, I'll just quickly show you where we now know hydrothermal vents are all through the oceans, at the edges of tectonic plates, um, sometimes close to where the trenches are. I just say the trenches are down this western side, mostly of the Pacific. Um, elsewhere, a few others as well, but mostly they're there. And hydrothermal vents are all the way around the, on the world where the um, plates mostly are coming apart, sometimes when they're coming together. The red dots are ones we have confirmed that someone's gone and looked at and said, yep, that's definitely a vent. Um, the yellow ones are ones we think are there from these plumes which can be detected coming up from them. And um, the formation of vents, so first of all, the geology, this is what the, the original um, expedition was sort of looking at, is how these things form. Um, so it's at these places mostly where tectonic plates are pulling apart, and you've got this fairly shallow chamber of magma, this hot liquid magma in the, in the Earth's mantle. It's pushing up into the crust. And what happens is seawater percolates down from above through holes in the, in the pores and so on in the crust, down and it, it reacts with this magma chamber and heats up. It picks up lots of chemicals from the rocks um, and becomes a, a fluid that is very different from normal seawater. And then it begins to rise up because it's very warm and eventually it explodes and gushes out through the seabed. So it is quite like um, a hot spring on land, like a geyser, only much hotter. They can be hundreds of degrees. Um, they are, there are several that are over 300 degrees centigrade. The water doesn't boil because uh, of all the pressure. So these things are incredibly hot. Some of them are super critical, we think. We think. The fluids are, are very toxic. There's virtually no oxygen. They're very acidic. Um, it's just a horrible place. That, so even like, being in the deep sea is one thing, but being on a hydrothermal vent is a whole other level of difficult life. So why on earth are things living there? Well, this was the thing that blew the biologists' minds, was that creatures down here had a new way of making food. They're disconnected entirely from this photosynthetic way of providing food, which up until that point, we assumed was the only way biology, how life could get energy, was from our sun, from our nearest star that provides that energy that those photosynthesizers are using to harness. 
and, and make those food for, for the rest of the ecosystem. These guys do it differently. It's all based on microbes that are able to do something entirely different, a dark alternative to photosynthesis. Chemosynthesis was discovered here on hydrothermal vents. These are microbes that don't need sunlight for the energy. They use chemicals, mostly methane and hydrogen sulfide. And they use that chemical energy to convert carbon dioxide into carbohydrates. And that's how they feed and sustain these ecosystems. Some of those microbes grow in kind of mats on the hydrothermal vent. You can see this white stuff covering this one here. Um, and that's this, these microbes, and some animals will just come and feed on those. But most of them have those microbes living inside them. They're symbiotic. And um, uh, so essentially all this tube worm has to do to feed is it has to, um, it's full of bacteria. All it has to do is provide um, carbon dioxide, some oxygen, and, uh, and some of this hydrogen sulfide and methane, and that's how it gets its food. It has no mouth, it has no guts, it just has bacteria to feed it from inside. So it is a very strange world, and it did really blow the minds of biologists. I should also say that um, the way these hydrothermal vents form, when those hot fluids reach the, reach the water, the cold deep sea, about two degrees it is generally down in the deep sea, um, a lot of those metals d deposit, they fall out um, of suspension, and they form these big tall, um, tall chimneys. You might have heard them being referred to as black smokers, and there are also white smokers. There's different chemistry going on in different places. Um, but they form these, form these towering tall chimneys, um, which can be tens of meters tall. And that is really what you see in a hydrothermal vent, these tall chimneys with these boiling hot fluids, caustic fluids coursing out of them, and then all of these species that have adapted to this extraordinary place. Um, including our snails, our hydrothermal vent snails. Now, they come from the Indian Ocean, from hydrothermal vents across the middle there, from three places. They've only been found so far in three populations. Of course, we haven't looked everywhere. They may be found in other places, but so far, we know a lot of the vents in the Pacific. I mean, if I go back to that picture, you'll see that, you know, we've visited a lot in the Pacific, quite a few in the Atlantic, and so far, no one's found any snails. So they could be incredibly rare. Um, but uh, when they were discovered, it did raise a particular, another conundrum amongst the biologists, which is, well, the problem is with these guys is they, they have a, um, they, again, they have bacteria living inside them. They have a pouch in their throat where they live. And so these snails make sure that those bacteria are happy, keeping them fed with all their chemicals. But in the process of chemosynthesis, of producing this food for the snail, those bacteria produce sulfur, elemental sulfur. And that, we know, is toxic to snails. So how on earth are they surviving this internal source of toxic molecules? Well, this is where we come back to their scales and their weird feet. Just last year, a paper was published by some scientists who took some of those scales and looked at the structure of them. And they found that they're basically made of these tiny, tiny nanoscopic columns. So this is a really close up shot of what's going on inside the, the foot, the scaly foot of the snail. And what it seems to be, what seems to be happening is that those columns are drawing the sulfur away from the body of this snail. The sulfur passes up these columns and then it reacts with iron in, dissolved in the water that's coming out of the hydrothermal vent and forming these um, iron sulfide particles, nanoparticles of things like pyrite. Um, and that's pretty cool. Um, and, and that's, I think, one thing that we can really take from this is that it's not just weird biology that's coming out of the deep sea, but ideas that we can really adopt and, and change the way we do things out on land. Making nanoparticles of pyrite out, out on land in industrial processes, it's useful. There's all sorts of things we can use pyrite for. They're used in solar panels and lithium batteries and catalysts, but they're very expensive to make because at the moment, the only way we know how to do that is at very, very high temperatures. And uh, here's a snail doing it, in fact, at a very low temperature, because they don't actually live right on that scorching bit of the hydrothermal vent chimney. They stay a little way back, just a few feet is all you need to get away from boiling yourself um, into snail soup. Um, so they live a little bit way away, where it's about 15 degrees, a bit warmer than the rest of the deep sea, but not scorching hot. And that's where they make uh, these nanoparticles of pyrite in their feet. And in fact, the snail doesn't even need to be alive for this to work. Scientists have taken scales from one of those populations where the snails are in fact white. They're not covered in pyrite, but they still have their white shells. And that's, we think, because those it happens to be that that um, hydrothermal vent doesn't have much iron coming out of it, so the water doesn't have iron to react with the sulfur. So what they did was they took one of those scales from that population, they took it off one of the snails, and they put it on the other vent where black snails do live. And they left it there for two weeks, and they went back. 
and the scale had turned black. It's still working. These columns are still drawing sulfur. The sulfur still reacting with iron in the water, and it's still turning black. So we have so much more still to learn about how the snails are really doing this, but it does offer us a glimpse of a new way, potentially, of making these sorts of nanoparticles, and not just iron, lots of other things too. Um, so I just love this idea that these strange, strange creatures living in this extraordinary extreme world have got ideas that we can really adopt and use and take and do new things with out here on land. But, and there is always a but, all of this and other wonders in the deep are at risk. Scaly foot snails have recently become the first species to be listed as endangered because of the possibilities of deep sea mining. Now, um, this is the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, and they have this thing called the Red List, which is a global list of species that have been studied and, and experts have got together to figure out what are the chances of that particular species going extinct. And they range from ones we're not too worried about, least concern, through vulnerable, endangered, which is where our snail is, onto critically endangered, and then extinct at the end. And the reason uh, that this snail has been p posted as being endangered uh, is because two out of the three of those populations that we know about have been um, given across, they've been given licenses to mining companies who are interested in knocking down those chimneys for the metals that they contain. As that hot water comes out of the seabed, it, lots of those metals are deposited and those chimneys are, they're full of minerals and metals. So one of them is the Care Event Field, which is over here um, in the middle of the Indian Ocean. Uh, and that one has been given to a German mining company. They've got a, a prospecting concession there. This is the Long Key vent field, which is in this incredibly remote part of the southern Indian Ocean, way south of Madagascar. Uh, and that's gone to a Chinese mining company. So, um, and I should say, these areas of habitat are really tiny. Kerai is 30 meters by 80. It's about the third of a size of a soccer field. Um, a really tiny bit of um, habitat. Long Key's a little bit bigger, but not much. So there's every chance that if those mines do go ahead, these populations of snails are going to be wiped out. Even though the mining companies say that, well, we're not going to mine the active vents, we're just going to go for the ones that have naturally stopped um, flowing these hot plumes out of and where animals aren't living anymore. But how are you going to do that from a distance? These things are going to be mined several miles down from the surface using remotely operated mining equipment. How are we going to do that? How is that even possible? Um, it really does raise a lot of questions about what kind of impacts deep sea mining could have if it does indeed go ahead. I mean, for, in particular for these snails, the point is that there would be a really simple way of removing them from that endangered class and sliding them back towards least concern. All we have to do is not mine those two vents. Then we can say that species is going to be okay. And that's actually something that we could do. These, mine, these areas that are looking to be mined are in the high seas. They're not under any national control. But there is a United Nations body, the International Seabed Authority, is in charge of overseeing the development of mining on the deep seabed in these areas beyond national jurisdiction. So they're in charge of deciding if mining goes ahead. They're in charge of deciding how it should happen and if it should happen. And they also have a responsibility in the legislation that's set out by the United Nations to look after endangered species and things like these snails. So there are big questions still open about how deep sea mining should and how it will carry on. And it's not just about snails. It's not just about even hydrothermal vents, although many others are looking towards being mined. There are hundreds around the world. There are about 500 vents, and many of those of a similar thing of having these prospecting licenses that have been given uh, to different mining companies. But it's not just about those. There are two other habitats in the deep sea that are being opened up potentially to this new wave of deep sea mining. One of them is seamounts. We've already heard about how corals and sponges, these ancient amazing creatures full of potential new chemicals, grow on these underwater mountains. Well, the miners want those too. On the outside of these seamounts, there are thick well, actually quite thin crusts of metals, metal-rich rocks, which they want to go and scrape off for the contents that they have. Um, that's happening. That's a sort of another other prospecting is happening on seamounts. And then the third place are abyssal fields, abyssal plains. These enormous undulating plains that we get um, down in the abyss. Um, I remember learning about these at high school in chemistry classes. I was told about manganese nodules that uh, lie scattered around on the abyss. And, and my picture in my mind at that point was just a bunch of mud and rocks. 
and nothing else. And maybe at that point, a little while ago, that was all we did know, and we did think that this was all that was down there. But now, science is showing us that this is another rich and important habitat. It's not as, as, not as necessarily as, as abundant and concentrated as something like a hydrothermal vent, um, but there is life that relies on these uh, abyssal plains and on these rocks that we find down in them. So you can see in this picture up at the top, there's a picture of uh, a bit of a central Pacific where one of these um, fields of nodules can be found. These are individual little rocks. They look a bit like lumps of coal, but they take millions of years to form, but I guess coal does as well. Um, and these ones form, uh, they start off life as a, as a little fragment of something hard, maybe a, a shark's tooth that was dropped millions of years ago or a little bit of bone. And then very, very slowly, me minerals and metals from the water will deposit on that, and very slowly they grow into these rocks, which are full of metals. But an ecosystem has evolved around that too. You can see in this picture here, that little thing looks like a flower. That's an, an anemone. Um, recently, we've discovered that octopuses really need these fields. Um, this is Casper the octopus, discovered, named because of its lovely white skin. Um, and these guys, the females, actually use the rocks as a place to lay their eggs. Sponges grow on the rocks because it's something hard for them to stick to. And there's a long, tall stalk, and the, the octopus lays her eggs on that, and she holds onto them while they're being while she's incubating them before they hatch. So it's a really important habitat for all sorts of different species. We've seen the same for seamounts. All three of these places where mines could begin are unique and important habitats. You know, in terms of the biodiversity that could potentially be, um, be damaged by mines, it's enormous. And it's not just that. There are bigger things to think about, too, in terms of the impacts that mining could have. There are concerns that scraping up across the abyssal plains, for example, could really disrupt the storage of carbon in those sediments. And we know that deep sea is a vital store of carbon. It's vital in the planetary balance of the atmosphere and carbon that's drawn down into the oceans. A lot of it does end up locked away for thousands of years. We need it to be staying down there. We don't need it to be released. We've got to, we need to have these intact, healthy systems. Otherwise, we really are going to be facing a much worse version of the climate crisis than we currently have. Now, there are no mines yet. This is something that could happen potentially in the next few years. It's been thought about for decades now, in fact. People were interested in mining module, nodules in the Pacific um, decades ago. In the 60s and 70s, that was what we were looking at. And then things moved on. The technology seemed too expensive and people abandoned those ideas. They're coming back now. We have the technologies, it's, it's there. We can use the sort of hybrid of these um, research modules that we've seen, these, these um, submersibles kind of blended with a great big enormous uh, mining machine. These are the kinds of things that are gonna be put down into the deep to harness modules, to knock down hydrothermal vents and so on. And a lot of the mining companies, the people who are looking to do this, who are prospecting, who are setting up these plans, they have a new idea as to why we need to do this. They're telling us that those metals down in the deep sea, that's what's going to save us from the climate crisis. We desperately need all of this to make solar panels and electric car batteries and wind turbines. And it's the only way we're going to solve the problem of reducing carbon emissions and greening our global economies. And that is one reason, a really big reason actually, why I decided to write my next book, which comes out uh, early next year, because I really wanted to look at that question. Are they really, is this really true? Do we really need these metals? Is this the only way we can get ourselves out of the climate crisis? Now, it's a big question. There's lots of things to say about it. Um, but I just want to say a few things to, today. Um, firstly, well, hydrothermal vents, we can pretty much take out of that equation. The sorts of metals that we find inside of vents are not the ones which are potentially going to come more and more difficult to find on land as supplies go, go run, run down. Things like cobalt, things like tellurium, cobalt for car batteries, tellurium potentially for solar, solar panels. Most of the metals we're finding in vents are not part of this renewables picture. So I think we can already just push them to one side and say this is not about climate change. And that really is a no-brainer. Given the sorts of organisms and the extraordinary things we're finding on vents, I should say that vents could be where life first began. We are finding clues that this is where the origins of life lay billions of years ago was on a hydrothermal vent. We need to keep these things intact so we can keep studying them. As for the others, well, there are other metals in, in those nodules and in seamounts that, yes, could be potentially important for making the sorts of 
devices that we need to, to get ourselves off of fossil fuels. There's no doubt that we will give up fossil fuels and we will adapt, we will adopt a new need for There are a lot of assumptions wrapped up in that statement about needing deep sea metals. Towards really and from the design stage onwards, making those metals, like really regarding them as the finite and precious resource that they are. Not something to use once and throw away, but we keep reclaiming and reusing the metals we have um, wherever they might come from. So that's something to think about. And isn't, I don't think, being, being tied into these ideas of mining the deep so much. The other one is assuming that we're going to use the current technologies that we have for things like car batteries. So yeah, maybe we do want to build, or some say, a billion electric cars to replace all of the ones driven by petrol and diesel. But do they all have to have the kind of batteries that are currently being made? 1980s technologies that were developed to put inside a handheld camera, uh, cam video camera. We have great new innovations coming through, solid state batteries, superconductors in uh, wind turbines that mean they don't need rare earth metals from, these um, from the, the nodules, from these planes, the abyssal planes. We have new ways of doing things and that we need to do. We need to really encourage and support those types of innovations. The new technologies that will give us the smart solutions that we need for the climate crisis and ones that aren't going to involve damaging people and the planet in the process. Now, finally, I just want to say that the deep sea does have other threats. It's not just about deep sea mining and this thing that's approaching this new threat that's on the horizon. There's already troubles uh, down there. There's fishing in the deep sea. People go fishing on seamounts, tearing up these ecosystems with trawling nets and targeting species that really don't have any chance of being sustainable. Fish living in the deep are very long lived. They live for hundreds of years. They grow very slowly. Not the kind of thing that a sustainable fishery is going to really be able to exploit without causing long term depletion. So that's happening. We also have increasing um, oil and gas drilling down in the deep. We have more and more ultra deep wells beyond 1500 meters down beneath the waves. And what we saw in 2010 with the deep water horizon spill just shows us what will happen if more of that sort of thing, more of that drilling in extreme depths takes place. And we really just need to leave that oil in the seabed anyway if we're going to deal with climate crisis. And the deep sea inevitably is where a lot of other pollutants end up. Here's a species that was named uh, this year. It was found in the Mariana Trench below 6,000 meters, and it was named for what was found in its stomach, Eurythenes plasticus. Plastic gets into the deep sea too. So to wrap up, the deep sea is clearly the last vast frontier on our planet, but we don't have to open it up like we have all the other ones. We could do something different with the deep. We could say, we'll just leave it alone. We could create an enormous protected space where we do something different and we change the story that humanity has always found new resources and used them up until they've gone. We could do something different this time. We could show that there are things that we just don't need. We can find alternatives. And we could show that there are places that are so special and unique and so important that we can just leave them alone. And I think the deep sea is one of those places. Thank you. So um, I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you so much for listening. Um, I am available now if you've got any questions. Hopefully you've been writing those all down. Um, and if you do want to know any more about the wonders of the deep and those strange creatures that have evolved to live in there, there's plenty more to be reading about in my book, which comes out in February, The Brilliant Abyss. I would love you to have a read. I also, as I say, really dig into this question of how um, should we be mining the deep sea? Um, what is the incentive for doing that? And what are the alternatives? Because I think we do have alternatives. So thanks very much. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you might be. And thank you for joining us here for our live Q&A session. We are very, very lucky to be joined by Dr. Helen Scales. Uh, and uh, hopefully we've got some great questions. We've seen some coming in on the, on the comments boxes. If you have any more questions, please just put them into an email or put them in the comment section on the YouTube link there. And it's the event, it's events at the IET.org. Um, so Helen, thank you so much for joining us. What a fascinating, fascinating end talk you've just given us there. Um, 
it's just a quick let's start at the beginning how on earth did you get into marine biology what what, what inspired you and how did you actually end up being a marine biologist so thank you so much as well for having me it's been such uh, a lovely thing to be involved in and i'm thrilled that you guys have all been watching at home that. um so marine biology yeah i was always a real nature kid as i grew up um i didn't live by the sea but i was up being outdoors as a kid kind of David Attenborough and yeah, um, documentaries on TV, all that kind of stuff. Um, and um, and yeah, and then I guess what's my teens? And I at that point um, thought I was going to go and save the rainforests. That was the time uh, when the Amazon was first sort of on the global radar, endangered place. I just kind of, I got this. I don't know, I want to say calling to the ocean. It sounds really corny, but I. Um, and that I wanted to go and learn to scuba dive and so I did that and the first time I got in the water I saw a fish um, I had this amazing thing with the wall all the way and I couldn't be in its world um, and I just wanted to know more so I really did like my vision was shifted from green to blue and that was it from then on I was completely hooked so um, yeah so then I went on um, I went on to study marine biology at university I did um, uh, an undergrad and then I carried on studying for a master's degree and a, and a PhD eventually because I just didn't, couldn't get enough of it to be honest um, and then also just diving and researching in, in some amazing parts of the world um, and just taking every opportunity I could to be in the oceans as well I think that was a, a thing I've, I've always tried to do and I still try to do is just to get out there and explore and I've been very lucky um, but you know just just keep trying to follow that passion really that, that hasn't died at all every time I get in the ocean I see something awesome and new and I keep wanting to do Fantastic. So uh, just coming on to some of the questions we've had in on, on deep sea mining and, and other environmental impacts. I mean, that's obviously a big topic, but could less invasive technologies be developed to access the valuable minerals in the deep sea without damaging all those really important habitats um, like the hydrothermal vents that you were showing us earlier? And is there a more sustainable option out there? So at the moment, this is the big question. Could we do this sustainably? And I think um, like the headline on that is that we, we don't currently know enough about these these delicate ecosystems the hydrothermal vents um sea mounts and these nodules in the abyss. we don't know enough yet to confidently say that anything could be done uh that could be counted as sustainable in terms of the biology that's down there even the geology i mean those rock those rocks um in the in the abyssal plains they take millions of years to form so you know on any kind of time scale that we're interested in once they've gone they've gone that's it i mean fine they might eventually come back but not not really in anything that we're interested in same with those um the, the sea mounts i mean those those crusts on the sea mounts take millions of years to form so on that sense that looks it's looking unlikely that sustainability is possible um and in terms of the technology of extraction even that i think is at a very early stage of being able to really grasp the full it, the full um, implications of what we're doing it's not just about removing those rocks it's about the sound that is, um that that is emitted when this takes place i mean it's going to be like you know hammering roads um but 24 7 um uh and as you might you know you know that the sounds underwater travel further they sound louder so in terms of the in interactions with life in the oceans that could be a huge impact the great big plumes of dust and sediment are going to be kicked up probably filled with with uh, toxic metals all of this is building a picture of this enormous impact beyond the sites of the mines themselves and um, so there's an awful lot to think about and i do think we are at a stage where it's too soon to say if, if if there's even any possibility of sustainability, um, which is why I think we need to stop and think very carefully about what to do. And I mean, are we, are we kind of in some sort of paradox then where we're, we're trying to find out more and more about the deep oceans and, you know, we've got more and more technologies and, and capabilities of getting down there, but actually by by showing that and, 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 and are we building our own pressure to, to exploit it more then? Yeah, it's a I find the whole, there is a kind of um, a paradox and a sort of two-sided thing to exploring the oceans. Because I mean, on a very simplistic level, you could say, well, if we didn't know that hydrothermal vents existed in the first place, we'd just leave them alone. So would it be better if we didn't know about them? Um, I mean, as a scientist, of course, I want to know. And as a biologist, of course, I want to know that these things exist. And I want um, scientists to be able to carry on studying these for, for forever. You know, for, we, we have so much more to learn. Um, but yes, at the same time, you can, you know, 
maybe uh, maybe we could leave things alone. But I, I do think we can find a balance, and I think we can learn not to simply say, "Oh, we want that now. Let's just take it." Um, in terms of that, the physical metals and minerals or whatever else is that might you know be extracted from these places, um, and that hopefully you know we really can find a good balance between exploring and discovering and learning just to say oh, you know that's cool let's just leave it be and learn more about it without sort of trying to fight um to you know fight a battle over who gets it first um but so yeah it's i you know i don't think there's a, a good answer for you know i wish we never knew about these things because of course i'm so fascinated and so many of us are absolutely inspired by what we're finding down there so we do have to keep looking but you know history tells us that exploration and exploitation have always gone hand in hand but usually history tells us again that it's the exploitation that seems to take uh, precedence. And, and, you know, we've seen recently in the news the huge iceberg that's drifting in the South Atlantic and the, and the Air Force have flown over showing this huge expanse of ice. Uh, I think it was, it's like thousands of square kilometres, something absolutely huge. Is climate change and, and, and things like that making a difference to the deep ocean? It is. I mean, you might imagine that so far down and so far removed from our surface, well, there can't be any way it's impacting, but it is. I mean, um, we should say, I mean, the ocean, the existence of the oceans and the massive volume of the deep ocean um, is one reason why we're all still here, frankly. If it wasn't for the oceans absorbing so much heat, 90% of the heat that's been it's, um, kept trapped in the atmosphere because of, of man-made greenhouse gas emissions, 90% of that heat has been trapped in the oceans, been absorbed into the oceans. And if we hadn't done that, then we'd already be in some horribly catastrophic version of the climate crisis than we are now. So, you know, we've got the oceans, we have a lot to thank for the oceans for what they're doing and also absorbing a lot of that CO2 as well. But because of that, we are seeing really big changes um, in temperature and in, in uh, carbon content and in, in the acidification of the oceans um, because of the carbon absorption. Um, it is reaching down into the deep sea. I mean, it's, it's obviously the surface seas are getting the brunt of all of these changes, but it is moving down and we're seeing um, increasing uh, temperature increases in the deep waters. One place, for example, is in Antarctica. A really important thing is happening, happens down there. Uh, affects the climate of the whole planet, which is this incredibly cold, the coldest, most salty water in the, on the planet forms in Antarctica and sinks down into the deep sea and then moves around the rest of the planet, driving this, this whole system that we call the kind of global conveyor belt. And that, um, that cold water isn't as cold as it used to be. That is warming up because of climate change. And, you know, and that is a big system that we're still trying to get to grips with to understand the implications of what will happen because of that weakening of this sinking water down in Antarctica. Similar things happening up in the Arctic. So we are seeing big changes. Um, and we're also seeing changes in terms of the biology. And you might think it's dark and everything's the same all year round in the deep sea, but even so you do get seasons. The pulses of food coming down from the surface, that marine snow I was talking about, you get times of year when there's more of it. Um, and so you do see seasonal changes um, amongst these abyssal ecosystems. And that too is changing because of the changes above. Um, so it does, climate change does go, it goes all the way to the bottom of the ocean. Yeah, no and, and plastics, obviously everybody, you know, um, understands the issues and the huge issues we've got with plastics in the ocean and the vast swathes of it. Um, how, um, how can that be sort of combated? What are the future impacts on, on the marine life, you know, and are we seeing big impacts already on marine life? So, yeah, I and mean, the, the plastics, it's sort of the, it's the big issue in the oceans that people are hearing about. So and I think that's great. Yeah, I feel it's, it's really opened a lot of uh, people's eyes to the problems and other problems as well, as besides plastic as well in the oceans. Um, but it is a big issue. Um, we're seeing it all the way again into the deep sea. Some of the most polluted parts of the oceans are in the deep. It's where a lot of that plastic is ending up. Um, in the Mediterranean off the coast of Italy, there's a, the highest concentration of plastic fibres have been uh, measured. It's the equivalent of about 100,000 fragments on the open pages of a, a book, basically, down on the seabed. So it's getting in there and we're learning more about the impacts on species. Uh, obviously, organisms are consuming those plastic fragments. It's um, stopping them from eating what they should be eating so they can starve. Um, it can actually cause wounds internally and actually it can interfere with DNA and things like that. What we don't know so much is how that feeds into a whole ecosystem level of impact. And that's the next stage in terms of understanding the plastic problem in terms of um, the oceans and in terms of ecosystems is, okay, fine. So individual animals can be impacted, but what does it mean for whole 
whole ecosystem, what does it mean for the whole ocean? We, we still don't have a, a full picture on that yet. Um, I think the solutions have to happen upstream. They have to start um, with our uh, users. We all know these things, right? But I do think that that is going to be more powerful than the Navy trying to clean up what's already in the ocean. That, a lot of it, there's just no way we're going to get it back. There's no way we can clean the seabed, unfortunately. I mean, I wish we could, but I just don't see that happening. What we have to do is switch off the tap. We have to stop the plastics getting into the oceans in the first place. Um, and I think I think we can do that. There are technologies that are available, even for cleaning up rivers. I mean, that's the main way plastics are getting into the ocean is, is through rivers. So that is a place to focus in, in terms of, of maybe filtering those plastics at that stage. But once it's out in the ocean, I, 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 unfortunately, it's, it's a bit too late. We've got a question came in, um, just going back to the kind of um, the damage from mining and take and extraction of, of, of those kind of things. Um, so if it's already taking place mining, this is particularly in the form of oil exploration, um, extraction, is there a view on the extent of the damage resulting from continued drilling and operation? So in terms of oil drilling specifically? Yeah, yeah I mean, um, absolutely. I think um, the issue to be aware of with oil drilling offshore is that there is this increasing push into what we call ultra deep waters. So below, I think it's below at least a thousand meters, we're seeing increasing um, activity. I mean, the deep water horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico was an example of, of the absolute catastrophe that can, can happen both in terms of human lives lost and in the, the ongoing ecological impacts in the deep sea, which no one's seen. <coughs> Um, of drilling in these ultra deep waters and um, the, the physical technical challenges of that are, are huge and then obviously the impacts can be even bigger because it's happening in in such a remote and difficult to get to place so i mean for me that's a no-brainer that um developing these these new wells in such deep waters is a terrible idea i mean we we should be leaving this oil in the ground anyway from a climate change perspective in the, in the seabed it needs to stay there um but there's even more reason to leave it in the ultra deep waters because of the potential um, problems that it could cause if there is another disaster, as we saw it in the Gulf of Mexico. Brilliant. There's, there's a couple of quick sort of questions here coming in related to the kind of mining and extraction. Who issues, is, who issues the licenses to extract minerals and, and, and other things from the deep sea? And, um, and are there ways that people can get involved um, with organisations in ocean sustainability to kind of put pressure on those bodies? So is there a, a global licensing for this kind of thing? Yeah, there is. So it's the International Seabed Authority. It's an organisation um, based out of the United Nations. And they have been tasked with a kind of slightly interesting two-pronged uh, um, uh, aim, really, of, of both allowing and figuring out how we're going to exploit the mineral resources of the seabed. This, I should say, is in the high sea, so outside of, of national boundaries. Countries that have their own parts of the deep sea, they can decide themselves. Or there is interaction with this international... Uh, regulations but but that is sort of somewhat slightly different issue out in the high seas where there's no national um jurisdiction the isa the authority is in control and they're currently going through the stages of deciding on what those regulations for mining the seabed are going to look like we look, it's all been delayed because of covid it was supposed to happen this year and um, it's looking likely that it will be next year um, interestingly a greenpeace report has just come out today about mining the deep seabed and about the role of the international seabed authority and the various companies that are looking to do this so i'd urge you to go and have a look at that i'll probably send a tweet out later about it if you want to have a look um literally just came out today um criticizing let's say for the way they have been very openly and some would say uncritically um handing out these licenses which by the way they get half a um, million dollars for in return but that's also an issue that greenpeace bring, bring up so um so do have a look at that greenpeace have got some interesting stuff going on there there's lots of other organizations you can look at that are working specifically on raising awareness about the issues of deep sea mining and what might be coming up and um, take a look at the um, deep sea um, conservation coalition they're a great group and um, the oxygen project are also working on this issue um, the Ocean Foundation and the Sustainable Ocean Alliance. There's quite a large group of, of biologists and NGOs that are concerned about really raising this in the public eye. This is, you know, the deep seabed is supposed to be, and it is, the cultural heritage of, uh, it is the, her the common heritage of humanity. We all kind of are joint owners of this place. So we all should have a say in what happens there and it, it, it matters for us all. Um, and that, that debate really needs to get opened up widely beyond just those, um, a small number of people 
and companies that are looking to start mining the seabed. Um, this is a much bigger issue for all of us, I think. Fantastic. Well, we're going to move now on to kind of exploration and science and those kind of bits. So um, we've got loads of questions coming about this. I'm going to start with what happens to creatures that are specially adapted to survive at extreme pressures? And when you bring them up to the surface and can they only survive in the deep or sometimes do you bring them up and they still survive? I love this. Um, so there used to be, I think this is sort of maybe a myth that's still around a bit, that um, if you get like a fish that lives in the deep and you bring it up to the surface, it's going to just explode because it can't deal with the lack of pressure. And, um, and that's not quite true. I mean, there are, sh in shallower waters, there are fish that have um, swim bladders. And if you bring them up too quickly, those, those do, they're basically balloons of gas and they do expand. Uh, and that can be a problem. But um, most deep sea fish don't have swim bladders, um, so that's not, not the issue. So they don't get huge and big and they don't explode. But what they can do is they can melt uh, in sort of and drop, just, just sort of fall apart because their cells and their, um, their bodies are so well adapted to such high pressure. But basically the cells are made, like our cells, your cells are wrapped up in um, basically a layer of fat. Um, and that's what keeps our cells sort of uh, con contained. But in the deep sea, rather than their f cells being made out of more kind of slippery um, fats, like say olive oil, um, uh, so sorry, they have, they're more olive oil-like than more buttery. So if it was, otherwise they, their cells would basically kind of crack and fall apart if they were quite solid. So they're much more liquid. Um, and you bring those up and you reduce the pressure and they just fall apart. They literally just fall apart. So that's one thing that can happen. So a lot of deep sea organisms just literally cannot cope when the pressure is relieved. Um, there are though microbes, so single cell creatures that do survive and can um, carry on living. And there are actually big um, animals too. I know there's um, a wonderful thing. Yeah, the the um, the snails I was talking about, they can survive. I've talked to, to biologists who studied those weird scaly foot snails and they bring them to the surface and they crawl around on their hands. They, they're in, in air. They're far, they're very tough creatures. Uh, so there are things that survive. Microbes can survive, um, but then there are some. Yeah, there are some microbes that only exist under high pressure. They're called pizza um, pizza file, which sounds tasty, but it's P I Z O. I think P I E Z O. Pizza is in pressure, um, and they have to have high pressure, and, and they grow better. You kind of bring them up to them. They kind of do all right, but if you then squeeze them in a container in a high pressure container, then they're off they go and they're very happy and they'll reproduce much quicker they need that uh, pressure to survive so yeah and and do you think there's a massive link between exploring the, the really deep oceans and um our exploration of of, of the solar system and and, and space is, is that something that and people often make that that link is that something that's that's real i think it is i mean i think in terms of our imagination and our, our sort of inspiration about life generally, I think there is that connection between what lives in the deep sea that is still so unknown and so strange and weird, and then our kind of imagination of what might be out there, the outer space and the inner space. I do think they're really linked. And then in terms of the technologies and the way we explore these places, again, I think there's a lot of parallels between what we do and how we access those places. I mean, a, a few brave and lucky souls get to go into space, equally a few of them get to go into the deep sea. But otherwise we use amazing technolog technological tools, probes and all sorts of things we can send off into outer space, we can send them down into the deep sea and look for these amazing signs of life and, and all sorts of other things. So we have this kind of distance to those both places. Like most of us are never going to get to go, obviously, in space, and most of us won't get to go into the deep sea. So we all we have are these sort of scientists bringing back stories and explorers bringing back stories from these distant places. And both, I think, are just equally as captivating. So I do see a lot of, a lot of similarities. Yeah. I'm going to going to ask you a few questions out on kind of the real sort of deep sea creatures and those kind of things. So let's start with a question we had sent in, which is. What's your favourite deep sea creature and why? Oh, it's such a brilliant question and, and almost impossible to answer because there's so many. And so I think I kind of change my mind um, on, a, on a daily basis, pretty much, um, on which I think is the most interesting. Because as soon as you find something new, then you think, well, that's that's the coolest thing ever. Um, but I guess, OK, today's favourite species is a dragonfish um, or any of the fish in the deep sea that are incredibly dark black. They're the blackest um sort of materials that we found in the natural world there are some very black 
um, feathered birds, birds of paradise, which use the black to kind of offset their beautiful feathers for like displays and stuff. But in the deep sea, fish are black, so they can't be seen. Because a lot of animals, as I mentioned, are bioluminescent, they glow. So um, it's not very useful if, if you're making light and then it bounces off you and you're sort of lighting yourself up. Um, that would be pretty, 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 uh, pretty bad if you're trying to sneak through the deep and, and hunt things and all not get eaten. So, so these black fish have evolved amazing dark skin, um, and it's melanin that we've uh, recently a paper just come out looking at the, the structure of that skin. It's a little bit like the scaly foot snail, the feet, um, and how that's an adaptation for living on hydrothermal vents. Um, the black skin is a way to stop being seen, and the um, as as light falls on these particular arrangements of, of melanin. Uh, granules mm -hmm. of fish. It's like um, it's a bit like a pinball machine. So um, as the pin kind of the ball kind of pings around between the flappers and the bumpers on on a pinball machine, that's what's happening to photons of light in the skin of these fish. The light goes in and it pings around, but it doesn't come back out. So you don't see any of that colour. Um, and um, we found that the black skin of these fish are they're darker. They 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 reflect less light than the the the, the most black human-made substance, a stuff called Vanta Black, um, which is made of carbon nanotubes, and that sucks the light in and doesn't let any out. These fish are even more black than that. Wow. And it's all That's because of this and you want to try and hide in the dark, so it's just super cool. Fantastic. And what there was, there was a specific question that came in during your actual talk today as well, which is um, if the hydrothermal vent animals are found at multiple vent sites, um, but they can only live on the vent, how do they survive away from the vent, vents to migrate across to each other's vents, as it were? Brilliant. I love this. I love this particularly because I've made a really detailed answer to this in my book. So, but I will give you the short version now. <laughs> I love that that's an interesting question for you. Um, yeah, so you can't survive away from a vent. It gets cold, there's no food there. So what do they do? Well, they don't move, but they send their um, offspring. So the, the, the adults send the, the eggs and larvae um, out into the dark, uh, cold waters between the vents in the hope that they'll find another one. Um, and there's different strategies for this. So um, some species um, have larvae that can survive quite well on their own. So some of the shrimp, there are um, shrimp that live on hydrothermal vents and their larvae can um, live for weeks or months and they can actually feed themselves. They can go up to the surface, they travel miles up to the surface, feed in those shallows where there's lots of food, and then they come back down and look for a vent to live on. Um, but again, those scaly foot snails, back to those wonderful snails, um, they don't do that. Their young um, can't feed themselves. All they have is a yolk. So these larvae that hatch out um, and swim around before they turn into an adult um, snail, um, all they have is a yolk that their mothers gave them. And when that's gone, that's gone. So there's no more food, so they don't get as far. So, um, so the snails don't have this long distance dispersal ability, which is another reason why they're so threatened. We can't expect there to be new larvae sweeping in from vents miles and miles away. Um, they just can't get that far because of the way their biology restricts their, their, their migration. Wow. Um, and another question here, which is, which bit of engineering hasn't been invented yet that you would most like to have built for you that would just completely transform your research and, and getting into those kind of deep oceans? My wish list covers so much. I mean, I should say, I mean, the technologies we have are already amazing. Um, but one thing that I think a lot of deep sea biologists sort of say, they wish they could what they would love to be able to do is is know what is living there that we don't see. Like even when we've got these amazing, we've got fleets of, of self-driving robotic um, submersibles which take themselves off and, and, um, and plow through the deep sea, taking pictures and gathering data. But they're not, all they can at the moment, all they can really do is take photographs of the seabed. And that's great. We do find new species and new weird things just from a picture of it. But wouldn't it be awesome if we could combine that with the biotechnology and um, and have a way and perhaps those things could grab um, DNA from the water. We know that eDNA, environmental DNA, is a thing that we can do now. You can just take samples of seawater, put that through a sequencer, and you can figure out what animals, what species were there. I love the idea of these submersibles being having like an onboard sequencer. So you could send them off, troops of these things could go through the oceans, and then they come back and they tell you, what they saw, the species that come up with a whole list of everything that they swam past. You know, maybe we'd find more giant squid and amazing stuff that's so hard to find if we could um, have that kind of DNA genetic onboard immediate sort of analysis going on. I think that would be amazing. 
So I've got a question that's come in specifically, I would think from a teacher by the look of it, but are, are there any plans to collaborate with the educational sector and produce a load of resources based on this talk? Because it looks like it would be really, really well received. Um, it would create massive interest according to this, this, this question here. So, uh, I mean, I know you've got a book coming out uh, soon. Uh, are you thinking of doing some educational resources around this kind of thing? Oh, I, I would really love to. I mean, normally when books come out, you get to go and do fantastic things like go to schools and talk uh, at science festivals. And that's all sorts of things I really hope I will be able to do. But it might have to be online more now. I mean, already I know I'm going to be doing a talk for the Cambridge Science Festival in the spring. And that's probably going to be online, which in a good way means people who don't live here, um, I'm in Cambridge <coughs> at the moment. Um, or who can't make it should be able to tune into that. So, so I will definitely be doing things like that. Hopefully, other events as well, such as that. Um, and then we'll see. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to do more. I've just started doing children's books as well, and I'm sure I could do one on the deep. I think that would be brilliant. Um, I should also say there's loads of other fantastic resources out there um, for educational resources on the deep sea. Um, and perhaps I could send out some. But if you follow me on Twitter, I've got some great organisations. There's things like the Monterey Bay. Um, Aquarium Research Institute, they've got some fantastic education stuff. There's lots of wonderful stuff out there as well. So, so there's lots of lots of stuff to look at. And this is one we had come in during your, your talk as well. Is there a depth limit for bacteria? And are these chemicals a direct response to bacterial threats? Or are the antibacterial uh, characteristics just a happy coincidence? Um, as far as we can tell, uh, there is no limit to the depth at which bacteria live. We find them um, living in the deepest ocean. Uh, there are there's even a species that was discovered and it was named after the Mariana Trench, the deepest part of the deepest, the deepest trench we have down at, um, what is it, like 11 kilometres, I think we get down to there. Um, so, they, they, yeah, there's no limits on that as far as we can see and on this planet, maybe on another one, we'll find out. Um, and yeah, I mean, these, these antibacterial compounds that bacteria are making that we're looking for, including that one from the, from the Mariana Trench, has got some interesting stuff, um, anti-cancer properties and things like that. And that is all just because they're fighting each other. It is a natural evolutionary process that's been going for billions of years. As bacteria evolve, um, they have to outcompete each other, especially in extreme difficult conditions like the very, very bottom of the ocean. <clears throat> So that's why they make these chemicals. Um, so it's entirely coincidental in terms of what we're using them for, um, but it's like a billion years of, of sort of evolutionary history that we're tapping into to hopefully solve some of the problems that we have today. And I've got the, I think this is the final question that we've got coming now, which is um, nanoparticles. Um, what are their sizes exactly? And, uh, and this person's working on antimicrobial and antiviral nanoparticles, which, to be honest, is not easy for me to say. If we can collect them for analysis in terms of antimicrobials. Anti there we go, I've got it right in the end. So the nanoparticles, are the, the snail's feet, the scales, I'm going to actually just admit, totally admit that I need, to, I need to go and check the paper for the actual size. I mean, they're very, very small. I mean, it's nano, there's like a definition of that, isn't there? I mean, I'm not the engineer. <laughs> I think it's like less than a nanometer, I guess. I guess something like that. So, so they, are, they are pretty tiny. Um, and how you handle those, again, it's kind of beyond my, my knowledge as a biologist. I think I'm more of the person who just... Uh, uh, looks at this and wonders how on earth you even like even that picture I showed you of that the the the, the, the really high definition microscopic picture of that foot I mean that blows my mind I've never imagined that this is all going on inside of the foot of a snail so it's, that's not a very good answer I'm afraid but I guess I'll just hand that back over to the to the biotechnology guys to help us out and, and I've got one one final interesting question for you which is if you um do you spend a lot of time working with marine engineers then you know who have all operate all of these kind of rovs and, and, and all this kind of stuff is it something that goes hand in hand in the kind of marine engineering and, and marine biology absolutely yeah so um i mean the, the latest expedition i did to the gulf of mexico um you have a ship full of people who go out there and you've got obviously you know if it's a biological expedition primarily then there'll be lots of people like me who who want to know about the squishy living things in those but the only way any of this is possible is by collaboration. Um, you know, we've got fantastic engineers <clears throat> running those ROPs for us. And they are, it is extraordinary to see how these things are operated at such distance. When we were using remotely operated um, uh, vest vehicles, which um, 
uh, you know, they're being, it's like, you know, it's like operating a, a remote control, you know, car, but from like three miles away. And you can see this little picture of what's going on. They were so incredibly skilled. And not only that, but you're working in turbulent conditions. I mean, I won't tell you how bad the weather was, but it was just extraordinary to be operating you know, at, out in the open sea. I mean, it, it's, it's a huge challenge. Um, but yeah, all of deep sea science is a collaboration. Every time a ship goes out, you've got chemists and biologists and engineers and physicists all working together to understand more about this distant place. Um, you know, it's, it's always got to be all of those people putting their amazing ideas together so we can come up with this new views of this remote, um, extraordinary space. Well, Helen, I think this is about the sort of time we've got to start wrapping things up. But just before we go, I, I've got to ask you then, we, we, give yourself a plug. When, when's the book out? Uh, it's out in the UK in February, out in America in July. Um, so I'd love you to have a look, mainly because I want you all to just um, think more about the deep and, uh, and potentially about mining and other impacts that we have there and to talk about it and um, make it a thing that's, you know, in, in all our lives, even though most of us are never going to get to go there. So. Brilliant. And we're going to be sending a lovely feedback sheet around to everybody who registered to see today. So if, you, if, if we'd love to hear your thoughts. And, I, and as well as that, you've got a, a Twitter handle there that we're going to put into the comments section, I think, or it might already be there. That's just, where other people can send questions into you and, and you'll try and get around to answering those as well. That's right, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Get me at Helen Scales and I'll be happy to uh, answer any more questions you guys have. So thanks so much. Well, Helen, look, thank you. And thanks to all the team who put this together. What a fascinating and really amazing end talk we've had today. There's another one coming up in February. I think it's the 15th of February. So look out for that. Um, Helen, once again, thank you from all of us for, for taking part today in the live Q&A and an amazing speech. Obviously, love to have had an audience there, but I think it still came across absolutely fantastically. So listen, have, have a great sort of Christmas break and we look forward to, uh, to seeing some of your book, well, the book coming out in, in, in February. Thank you ever so much and, and take care from all of us. Thanks so much. My pleasure. Cheers.